In this lecture, I'm going to take you through the gender, the factors affecting gender and educational achievement, focusing specifically on the internal factors. But before we look at those internal factors, what we need to look at is what the, the actual trends are. And what's been noted is that the, the difference between girls and boys in terms of their educational achievement actually starts very early in their educational experience. Um, in 2013, the teacher assessments that are done when students first start in school, so in reception, noted that girls were outperforming boys in literacy, language, maths, and personal, social, and emotional development. So girls were starting the education um, journey, if you like, further ahead than boys. And that gap widened throughout Key Stage 1 to 3 um, in most subjects, particularly humanities and English. Um, but then narrows again when it starts to narrow in the sciences and the maths type of subjects and technical subjects. Um, the average gap at Key Stage 4 um, in terms of GCSE point score is between 5 and 10 points um, when looking at attainment 8 or uh, percentage points in terms of um, numbers of eight, um, level 4s and 5s. Um, again, there's a more of a narrowing if you're looking at specific subjects such as sciences and the technologies, um, but girls are still outperforming boys. The gap at A level is even more narrow and this can be due to the fact that you're taking fewer subjects and you don't have any compulsory subjects. So you're free to choose subjects that you feel you're talented in or you're interested in. And that can have a big impact on educational achievement is whether or not you have an actual interest in the subject or you want to do well within that subject. So the, the gap at um, A level is a lot narrower for that for that reason um, but it's also for that reason that sociologists tend to focus in on GCSEs um, for educational achievement because in the UK that is the qualification that vast majority of 16 year olds take. Now there are other alternative qualifications that can be taken GMVQs, BTECs, IGCSEs and things like that but vast majority of students in the UK do GCSEs at 16. So it gives a huge data set for sociologists to be able to use to kind of identify the trends and possible causes of those trends. If we look at vocational education, um, more boys than girls take vocational qualifications and those are qualifications which are more practical in nature and are more um, hands-on if you like. But when looking at the results, girls are more likely to get a distinction than boys are. Um, so we're still seeing that girls are outperforming boys within vocational education. It's just more boys take it than, than girls do. And we'll talk about subject choice in a later lecture. So what we, if we look at the trends at GCSE, the first one we're going to look at is the average attainment eight score. Now, if you remember from when we talked about measuring educational achievement, um, the way the attainment eight score is determined is by adding up your grade score. So your sevens, your eights, your nines, um, etc. And uh, for eight subjects, English and maths, then your EBAC subjects and anything you've got left over would be the highest um, grades from the other subjects, however many spaces you have. Um, and that gives a um, point score for your attainment at GCSE. And what we can see in this graph, and I've only gone up to 2018, 2019, because I can't, we can't use the 2020, uh, 2021, because they haven't been done yet, but also because same with the 19, um, 2020 grades, because of COVID, the GCSEs weren't sat in at all, or weren't sat, weren't externally provided for. So um, the most up-to-date data that we can use at the moment is the 2018-2019 academic year. And what we can see from this graph is that since 2014, when the new um, when the curriculum changes started coming in, 
um, under Michael Gove, we, we, we're seeing that there is a huge discrepancy between girls and boys, with boys ranging somewhere between 43 and 47, um, sorry, yeah, 43 and 47 points, with and girls between 49 and 52. So there is that quite considerable gap. And when we compare the girls to um, the national average, they're, they're still quite massively outperforming the national average showing that girls are performing better at GCSE overall than boys are. If we look at the percentage group achieving grade four or a C in EBAC subjects, again, there's quite a discrepancy with girls averaging around 30% getting um, grade, grade four or grade C, but boys just under 20. So there's a 10% difference between 10 percentage point difference between what girls are achieving and what boys are achieving. And that's what sociologists are interested in. They want to know why. What is it that is causing this widening gap of attainment and achievement between girls and boys? So the rest of this lecture is going to be looking at the internal factors so these are the ones that are within the education system. So we're not just talking about within the school itself or within the classroom. We're talking about the education system as a whole. So we're going to be looking at government policies and programs. We're going to be looking at role models, changes in the curriculum, and we're going to be looking at labeling theory. Now we've covered all of these things before in different contexts than this, but we're now going to bring that together into this particular context. So the first one we're going to look at is government policies and programs. Now we're going to look at this in two ways. First, we're going to look at how government policies and programs support girls' achievement, and then what they're doing about boys' achievement. Okay, because it has been recognised that boys are not doing particularly well in education compared to the girls, so there is policies and procedures that have been put in place to support them. So Bowler um, talks about how policies that the government have put in place, such as um, pro, um, specific, specific programmes such as Just and Wise, have given um, more aspiration to girls. They've created, they've removed some of the barriers girls face and, according to Bowler, made the education system more meritocratic. Okay, so these pro specific programs, just and why, so girls in science and technology, women in science and engineering, are opening up opportunities for girls, creating more equal opportunities within schools, trying to de genderize subjects. Um, and that has given girls far more aspiration to do well, to, to look at different subjects that they could do well in and excel in. What we've also seen is changes to the curriculum. Now, this is both in what is taught, but also how it is taught. So in terms of what is taught, that we've talked about before about the diversification of the curriculum. Um, and it's not just based around ethnicity, it is based around gender as well. So we're seeing that English is moving away from being dominated by dead white men. Uh, dead Western white men, particularly, and we're seeing more female authors and poets, more ethnic minorities coming into the curriculum to give a more diversified um, subject matter. We're seeing um, units being added into history curriculum, such as the role of women in World War II or women within the Tudor um, era and, and, and things like that. So we are seeing the focus moving away from men and bringing in more female elements to the curriculum. The discussion of, diff of more female scientists. Um, in, I know in sociology we tend to talk a lot about male sociologists, um, but we are we, we we do look at the female sociologists, and not all female sociologists are feminists, but the vast majority are. Um, which can limit the, the kind of um, studies and sociologists we can discuss because we've got to give a broad 
perspective basis to sociology. But in terms of how um, the national curriculum is delivered, um, we have, first of all, saw the introduction of coursework, which I know things have changed now and we'll come back to that a bit later, but um, coursework really did support girls in terms of their educational achievement. Um, girls are more likely to take time over their coursework their time, and that's going to give them a higher grade going into an exam. And finally, we've got league tables and marketization. Okay, and this is, comes from the work of Slee, and I'm really hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. But he points out, or she points out, that um, when marketization and league tables and all of that came into, into the education system in 1988, it some, suddenly made girls more desirable to schools. Girls achieve higher. Girls don't cause, have as many behaviour problems as boys. And that means that the school ha gets higher in the league table. It means they have a good reputation. And that feeds on into having more children or more students applying to go to that school. Um, Slee points out that boys are four times more likely to be excluded than girls are um, in terms of permanent exclusion. And schools have to be open about their permanent exclusion. It's public record. So schools can get a really bad reputation if they have a high level of exclusions. Now, there, there is manipulation in there and there is a way of gaming the system, and we'll, we'll, we, which we talked about before. Um, but schools don't want to have a bad reputation that they exclude, have high levels of exclusion because that suggests that the school is a bad school. And if you've got a reputation of being a bad school, people don't apply to come to your school, your funding falls and everything else because of the funding formula. So um, schools are covertly, because remember we can't, they don't select at state level, um, more de girls are more desirable as a student because of all the things that I've just mentioned. Now, as I said, it has been identified that boys aren't doing as well as girls in education and that it starts from a very early age. So there have been policies and there have been programmes that have been put in place to help boys with their literacy in the um, with the aim of better attainment at GCSE. So this came from the Raising Boys Achievement Project, which took place between 2000 and 2004. It was a government project which looked at the, the issues and the barriers that boys were facing in their education that were preventing them from achieving good grades. Um, and they focused on um, Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 4, but the, from this study, from this report, some policies were introduced, mainly in, key, in uh, primary school, to increase literacy levels, which was one of the key areas that they identified as being an issue, with the hope that that would then feed through to GCSE. For example, you have the Playing for Success programme. And what this was, was a programme which looked at literacy, numeracy and ICT amongst demotivated Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 3 students. And these students would then be given, so it wasn't paid for, it was given um, out of school hours study support at sports clubs and football clubs and places like that to kind of not only help them with their numeracy, literacy and ICT, but also to change attitudes regarding education and show the, the importance of education um, by using these sportsmen and, and women to, to kind of motivate young demotivated boys and girls in Key Stage 2 and 3. The, another programme was Reading Champions, with literacy being a key focus coming from the Raising Boys Achievement Project. What was then um, put out was uh, or were um, celebrities, famous people talking about reading, showing that they enjoyed reading, making recommendations about books, trying to raise the um, value of reading. 
because literacy can have a huge impact on your educational achievement and by reading you can massively improve your literacy levels so they use the they have video clips posters so um, celebrities going into schools and all of this to raise the value of reading within schools now we don't know the impact of these policies yet because the first group of students that were involved in these policies would have sat their GCSEs last year and this year and obviously COVID and all the rest of it's just kind of destroyed the data that they could have collected so we're still waiting to see whether or not these policies and procedures actually have had an impact on closing the gap between girls and boys in their educational achievement the final policy that um, was put in place was to recruit more male primary school teachers now in 2019 um, data showed that in primary only 14 percent of primary school teachers were male and this mm. kind of gives out the impression that education is a female endeavor that academics and and learning are female activities and which can then lead to boys not valuing it not being not being motivated to do well um, particularly in primary school which then follows through into secondary and um, GCSEs and A-levels so by recruiting more male primary school teachers they're then able to raise those aspirations of uh, young boys show them that education and learning is worthwhile and is not a female in uh, activity um, and the numbers of male primary school teachers are increasing but they are still relatively rare and that could be possibly due to social stigma attached to primary school teachers uh, male primary school teachers that's really quite wrong and rude to, is the suggestion of why would a man want to teach small children there must be something wrong with him to want to cheat to be around small children all day um, and that stigma can prevent men from applying for primary school teach training but we are seeing changes in that we are seeing more and more primary school male primary school teachers applying and qualifying the next factor we're going to look at is role models within education as i just said in primary school only 14 percent of um, teachers are male but what what's helping girls to achieve more is seeing increasing numbers of women in senior positions in school um, this the 2019 data said that in secondary schools 38 percent of head teachers are female and that's an increase of five percent on the previous data set which came out in 2016 so there are more more and more female head teachers um, at secondary level in primary level we see a lot more female head teachers um, with um, only 27 percent of them being male but we are seeing more and more women within um, slt roles assistant heads deputy heads and that can show girls even if they don't want to go into education that they can achieve high level positions in the workplace not just within education um, but it suggested that the lack of male primary school teachers um, can be caused by um, can, can, can lead to sorry student uh, male, boys students suggesting that as I said female activity so by having these role models within education seeing girls women at high levels provides aspirations for girls to, to aim high, having more male primary school teachers defeminizes education and learning as a female activity. The next factor we're going to look at is the changes in curriculum. And I've already mentioned this a little bit um, previously, look, talking about the diversification of the curriculum and the instruction of coursework. But I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail now. The first change in the curriculum is put forward by Sewell and he talks about the feminization of education. He argues that schools do not nurture masculine traits such as competitiveness and leadership and instead celebrate qualities such as attentiveness, um, passivity, quietness in class, um, 
which tend to be more female um, traits. And so girls tend to do better in school because school culture um, prioritises and celebrates and demands, if you like, what would traditionally be considered female um, personality traits. And the masculine um, personality traits tend to then lead to discipline problems, behavioural problems, anti-school subcultures, which lead to boys underachieving. So the educate that Sewell is arguing that the education system in and of itself is sexist, if you like, because it's part, it, it's built towards a more female type personality. There's also the discussion of coursework. Now, things have changed a bit in terms of coursework. The coursework was first introduced in 1988 as part of the um, Education Reform Act. Gorart, and again, I really have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly, noted that the achievement gap was pretty consistent between 79 and 89. So it, it was relatively even. So it's suggesting that once coursework it was introduced and that gap began to widen, that you could link it back to there was a causal uh, sorry a correlatory um relationship with coursework girls and mythos and brown argue that girls are more successful in coursework because it's about being conscientious it's about being organized it's about being independent um which puts them at an advantage over boys who tend to be a little bit more um, impulsive, disorganised, um, and can lack those independent skills that coursework requires, and that conscientious going back, rereading it, um, editing, etc. Boys are more likely, according to Mitchell and Brown, so this is not me, this is a, this is a sociologist, suggest that boys are more likely to to say, "Good enough is." enough whereas girls are aiming more for perfection so we'll put more effort and time into it we also need to look at um, how the correct changes in the curriculum are challenging stereotypes and viner and i'm hoping i'm pronouncing that correctly it might be Weiner, but who knows talked about how um recent developments in curriculum are about the diversification of um textbooks and of the content that is taught and the removal of gender stereotypes from textbooks um, and the way that we talk about certain subjects um viner pointed out in 19 between 1970s and the 1980s girls were often portrayed as wives mothers in textbooks um when you looked at a science textbook you would only see male scientists um you wouldn't see female scientists so the, these kind of gender roles were perpetuated, not formally, but kind of subconsciously in the way that the textbooks were written and the images and uh, imagery that was used when teaching education, uh, 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 teaching, not teaching education, but teaching in general. Um, but oh, and in recent years we're seeing more diversification we're seeing more um equality within the imagery within textbooks within um teaching in general which is leading to greater achievement in girls as they are prevent presented with more positive images of what they can achieve they can now aspire to more than wife and mother okay our final internal factor is labeling and we've talked about labelling a lot, okay? So this is not something that is um, new to you. But the first thing we're going to talk about is teacher attention. So um, Jane and Peter French did a study where they looked at interactions within the classroom. So they were doing an observation. It was a non-participant observation. It was an overt, uh, I believe it was overt. Um, but I'm not sure. 
But what they did was they observed these classroom interactions to kind of see what sort of interaction was happening between the teacher and girls and the teacher and boys. And there's a really good documentary that's on the website that you can you can look at, which um, is called No More Boys and Girls. And you can see some of how the teacher interaction that Jane and Peter Finch identified. You can actually see it in, in, in action because what they noted was that boys do get more attention in class the attention they're getting tends to be more negative attention. Boys tend to dominate discussion and debate, and whereas girls tend to be more democratic uh, and kind of the taking of turns kind of thing. And in the documentary of No More Boys and Girls, it's a two part documentary that you can, you can watch on the web from the website. Um, it's also about the language that was used by the teachers within these interactions, which were reinforcing traditional gender stereotypes. Um, the teacher involved, um, Graham Andre, uh, would refer to the girls as sweetheart, darling, things like that. Boys would be mate, dude, thing, things like that. So it's talking not just about teacher attention, but also language that's attached to um, boys and girls in primary level, as well as higher up in the school, that's reinforcing those um stereotypes and because boys tend to get more negative attention that leads to school subcultures and uh, disruptive behavior and things like that which can limit their educational achievement you also need to think about the ideal pupil and becca's idea of the ideal pupil where um is that um girls are more desirable they, they, they embody the characteristics of the ideal pupil the the quiet passive getting on with the work academically trying not necessarily academic able but academically trying um which then can lead to girls being given more challenging work because there's evidence that they can do it and, and that they need to be stretched and you do note, note that in gifted and talented groups, there does tend to be more females than males. Girls are more likely to be identified as gifted and talented, except in sport. Boys are more likely to be identified as gifted and talented in sport than girls are. But in academic subjects, classroom based subjects, girls are more likely to be identified as gifted and talented probably because they fit the the characteristics of the ideal pupil and that leads to them being able to achieve more because they're given more educational opportunities and finally you've got lavish subcultures and what we're talking about here is that the idea of sub um, symbolic capital boys tend to gain symbolic capital amongst their peers by being disruptive the class clown by seeking status from and not necessarily being in an anti-school subculture but more anti-school anti subculture type behaviors whereas girls tend to get their um, symbolic capital from academic achievements um, and because boys are trying to gain this um, symbolic capital through these negative behaviors or anti-school based behaviors they're more likely to find themselves excluded either on a fixed term exclusion or heading towards a permanent exclusion if you're not in school you're not achieving so boys will underachieve compared to girls because they're less they're more likely to be out of the lesson for behavioral reasons than girls are okay so are the internal factors the main reason well possibly but they're, they're not perfect the first reason they're not perfect is the radical feminists point out that girls still have, a, in general, a negative experience in school. So despite the fact that they are achieving more, it's not necessarily because of the changes or because of these internal reasons, it's more in spite of them. And you would have heard about the recent report that came out about sexual harassment and sexual abuse in schools which pointed out that nine out of 10 girls reported being victims of some form of verbal or physical sexual harassment during their school career. 
and that can lead to quite a negative experience in school so it, it can go one or two in a number of ways it could be that the girls kind of hunker down and kind of if i'm quiet and i'm and i kind of keep to the shadows keep to the the fringes and just get on and do what i need to do to get through to the end of this then i'm less likely to become to get on the radar of the people who are who are um, engaging in this behavior or it could be that they then um and that can lead to them achieving more but it can also lead to girls becoming a school refuser and who can blame them who wants to go into a school where you're going to end up being sexually harassed verbally or physically by your schoolmates um and so although girls are achieving more their experience within the education system isn't as good as the as as boys may have it we've also got to talk think about recent curriculum changes so the most recent curriculum change came under michael gove um in about 2013 2014 and this kind of did away with coursework um in an, in an attempt to to close the gap between boys and girls it was identified that coursework was leading to the girls um achieving more so maybe if we got rid of that it would it, it, um level the playing field um but also things like getting rid of uh modular exams um going to the linear process um perhaps these were all attempts to um level the playing field between boys and girls now again we don't know if that has actually worked because we're still um the first it was done in three waves the third wave of um changes occurred three years ago since then we've had two years of non-examination um due to covid um We've also got to take think about the fact that there are still male domination in positions of power. As I've said before, 38% of secondary head teachers are female, but that means that 62% of head teachers are male. The vast majority of the teaching population is female. Okay. So um we are seeing that there are still the vast majority of positions of power the majority of the ceos in charge of multi academy trusts are male majority of secondary education teacher head teachers are male um the head of ofsted was uh, uh, is currently female but historically has been male so we can't necessarily say that these role models that we were talking about earlier are actually having the impact that they're having because the ch the, there isn't as big a change the, the change has been exaggerated and finally there's still gendered subject choice okay and the gendered genderization of subjects and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more when we do subject choice in a future lecture but it can limit girls opportunities and limit girls choices and options in when they when they leave school because they, they don't necessarily take the subjects that they want to take because they're seen as being masculine so there is criticism of these internal factors which means that they're perhaps not the um only cause of the differences in gender education and, gen and educational achievement so we've looked at policies and programs we've looked at role models and we've looked at curriculum changes and labeling and how they can Im uh, impact educational achievement of girls and boys leading to the trend of girls outperforming boys at GCSE in the next lecture we're going to look at the external factors of feminism changes in employment gender or socialization and changes in the family